Well, good morning. Um, it's great to be here in rainy California from uh, Maryland, where it was 80 degrees yesterday and sunny. <laughs> I uh, really appreciate coming to California again. This is actually the, uh, my father graduated from this, this uh, university uh, just before World War II. He was a transfer student. He had done some work. He had done some schooling first at uh, uh, Compton Junior College in LA, and then he came here. And he was the first in our family to, um, to get a, a college education. So this morning, I wanted to, uh, to talk a little bit about a very important topic. I think we all understand that it's an important topic. That is diversity. Um, you know, for those of us who think about undergraduate education and those of us who might be working at a research university, as you do, you know, diversity is, your, is, is our greatest opportunity. In the sciences, we know that when we have a diverse group of scientists, hard problems are more easily addressed. Uh, Mark Schlissel talked a little bit about that last night. We also know from, from studies that when persons are, when, when a group is diverse, then they tend to look outwards, and that in turn leads to innovation and creativity. And so in, at, at a university, that's exactly what, what we want, and that, that's a great opportunity for us. And further, in the United States, we don't have to work very hard to be immersed in diversity, and especially, and this morning, even though Diversity can be measured in many different ways, all of them important. I want to focus on race and ethnicity. And so not only is diversity good for us and good for science and good for universities and good for higher learning, but also we don't have to work very hard to be in it. As you know, the US population is already about 30% underrepresented minorities. That is African Americans, Latinos, and Native Americans. You know that in 25 years, this country will be majority minority. I don't have to remind you, those of you who live in California, that this is happening. And in fact, last year, the public school kids, the 50 million public school kids in the United States who are in K through 12 schools, already that population became majority minority. And so there we are. We're, we're, we are living it. They are here. We are here. So that's the good news. We don't have to do much to experience this. The bad news is that, at least in science, we're not taking advantage of this, this talent pool. The population is about 30% or so underrepresented minorities. In the scientific workforce, it's about 9% underrepresented minorities. And I would argue that the undergraduate time, especially at large research universities, that you, that we, have a critical opportunity, a critical role in advancing diversity in the sciences and in other disciplines. The, the data for sciences, sciences is, uh, I think, uh, worth noting. Today, about 33% of the students who come into college wanting to study STEM are underrepresented minorities. So that represents the US population very well. So we don't have to encourage people that this is interesting. Yet, by the time we look at the baccalaureate degrees in STEM, about 16% are underrepresented minorities, and only about 9% of our PhDs in STEM are underrepresented minorities. And further, if we look at studies that say, well, you know, if we look at students who come to college with the same background, they came from high schools that had something beyond Algebra 1. They came from high schools that had laboratory courses along with their science courses. They come from families that valued higher education. Even then, when we look at those data, underrepresented minorities leave STEM disciplines at about two and a half times the rate that whites and Asians do. So I would argue that there's something that we're doing at the undergraduate level that disproportionately affects this very important population of students. And there's an urgency here, right? Because the US, because the US population is changing so quickly, if we can't do this, if we, if we can't figure out how to do this in a better way, then at some point it becomes an existential issue for us. 
Let me just use PhDs as an example. Now, not every student should go and, and get a PhD in science. I understand that, but it is a way for us to look at sort of our progress. Also, students who go on for a PhD are often reflecting their undergraduate preparation. So right now, about 9% of our PhDs in science are underrepresented minorities. And if we look at the last 40 years or so, in terms of the rate of increase of the, the percentage of underrepresented minorities getting PhDs in the sciences, there's a small slope, a positive slope. If we were to extrapolate that slope to where it would be, if we, if we were to extrapolate that line until it would reach 30%, that is at parity with today's population, it would take us about 100 years at our current rate to reach parity in terms of underrepresented minorities receiving PhDs in the sciences. That's if the US population holds steady at 30% minorities, but it won't. And so the question for us, and this is the scale issue that I'm interpreting Carol's question, the scale, the scale, the scale issue, a challenge for us, is how do we increase that rate? How do we change that velocity so that we're not at a point where we no longer have a future because we can't attract the population that, would, that should be uh, at our universities, succeeding in our universities and in science. And it's not just entry that I'm talking about. I'm talking about successful completion of undergraduate degrees. Now, I work for a scientific organization, and so I think especially about science, but I would suspect that something very similar could be applied to other disciplines represented in this room. Now, since 1988, Howard Hughes Medical Institute has provided grants to colleges and universities uh, for science education. And most of these grants have gone to supporting activities for students. So for example, we support a lot of undergraduates who are doing research. We support outreach through colleges and universities. And these are all great. These are all important, no question. No question that they had some impact. But when we look at that long history of 20, more than 25 years now, what we see is that very rarely was there any permanent change at those colleges or universities. In other words, you get a grant, you support 20 kids a year to do summer research, and when the grant's over, you don't support 20 kids anymore unless you get another grant from somewhere else. And so last year, we announced a new competition called Inclusive Excellence. This competition is currently running. Over the next two years, we're going to do this in two rounds. We hope to be able to fund 60 colleges and universities. Each of them will get a million dollars. So this is a $60 million initiative. And our focus for the in Inclusive Excellence competition is to change the focus, change the emphasis to encourage those colleges and universities to change the, their capacity for inclusion. We've gotten uh, 511 pre-proposals, and I've taken a look at them. They're being reviewed now, and at the end of this spring, we'll be announcing about 100 of these schools that will be invited for full proposals. Then we'll fund 30, and then we'll do this all again beginning this spring. So if I look at, I've, I've looked at those pre-proposals, and I have to say, that um, you know, some of the schools get it. They're really trying to think about their capacity for inclusion. But many of the schools perhaps don't believe us, or perhaps they didn't really want to listen to what we were trying to do. It's very different. It's very hard. And so many of the pre-proposals are talking about more activities for the students. And so what we're trying to do here is to get away from the, the idea of we're going to fix the students, and rather we're going to ask, ask the institution to take some responsibility. So let me give you just three examples of the kinds of things that I think we should be looking for through this competition, but also all of us that are thinking about higher education in terms of changing the capacity of an institution for inclusion. Because I think that's how we can accelerate this. This is a scaling strategy. So the first, I think, idea would be to think about faculty development. I think faculty development should be intentional. I think it should be focused on pedagogy. That is, how do you teach in an inclusive way? And also, it should show us, faculty members, it should train us in the skills 
necessary to understand the students with whom we are working. That includes understanding unintended bias, privilege, stereotype, stereotype threat. These are, are ideas that we're all familiar with, and I think that it's important for us to intentionally train faculty, especially our research faculty, about in, in, in these skills, in pedagogy as well as in inclusive uh, behaviors. The second suggestion, and the second example anyway, in terms of changing the capacity, is to look at the introductory experience. We heard last night, we heard yesterday, the, some of the data that was coming from uh, this place about the importance of undergraduate research and how most of the time it's happening in, in sort of an apprentice-based method, often at the senior year. Well, the senior year is too late. Because if we look at the persistence data for all students, and especially for underrepresented students, they're leaving our disciplines, they're leaving science in the first couple of years. So if you wait till they're seniors, you ain't gonna have the diversity that we're, we're, we're looking for. And furthermore, an apprentice-based research experience, that was, that, was, that was the way I came through, right? I found a, a sucker professor who took me in his lab, and I worked in that lab for four years, and it was great for me, but that's a very expensive proposition, not only because I get paid during the summer and all this, but also it takes up a lot of time. It's a one-on-one -on -one kind of a thing. So how do you scale this? And how do you scale it at a time when students are still starting off? Because if we can do it at the freshman level, freshman year, then we can be thinking about measuring potential rather than selection for those who happen to survive to their junior or senior year. And so there's several examples that many of you might be familiar with. One of them is the course-based research experience that HHMI funds called the C-Phages project. Last year we have, uh, this year we have about 3,700 students at 84 different colleges and universities, all engaged in the same research project called the C-Phages Project. 60-something percent of those kids are freshmen, 80-something percent are freshmen or sophomores. That's an example where there's a national course where we put a lot of effort into the infrastructure in terms of showing the instructors how to do this. We provide the materials. We, it's, 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 it's a well-structured, well-frameworked uh, kind of, a, kind of a, uh, experience for the students, and everybody's sort of doing the same thing. Uh, this is the discovery-based approach. I think it's very effective, and, and I think the evidence would suggest that. A different approach is the Freshman Research Initiative uh, started at the University of Texas, Austin, and is now being uh, tried at other universities as well. In here, uh, in the FRI, or the FRI uh, initiative, the idea is rather than everybody doing the same project, what you do is you work with faculty on that campus who each develop research projects for freshmen, and then you have to put in the infrastructure, that is you have to put in mentors and, and other folks who help those students then move through the lab, get, in, get an introduction to research, and then actually become productive. So either way, there has to be a fair amount of attention to what I'm calling the infrastructure of teaching these kinds of things, but I think that they can be very effective, and these are ways of scaling that experience, not selecting those few, but rather including as many as we can. The third example, or the third thing that I think is important for uh, changing the capacity of an institution is the structure and the policies that the university has in place. Um, the structure could include the curriculum and how it's built. You know, in the sciences, we think that it's important for every student to get everything that we've ever learned in biology or in chemistry or in physics or in math or in engineering. And, and you know, that's a lot of stuff. And there's a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a tendency that until you get all that content, you're not ready. Well, I think that's a mindset that requires some challenging. I think if you look at some of our successful folks in the sciences, in engineering, in computer science, they often didn't finish a college degree, let alone do all of that stuff. And so the question is, can we build a curriculum that is more flexible so that students can start at different points, including students who come to university not in their freshman year, but perhaps in their sophomore year, transferring from, say, community colleges, and a flexibility so that a student might have to repeat a course or take another course and still be able to graduate and see success on time. That requires 
close attention to the students. Berkeley has the Berkeley Scholars Program, which is a terrific model for how to help students understand what they're doing and where they should be going. And so it has to go, you know, a change in curriculum has to go hand in hand with attention to, to, the, uh, to, to, to the students in terms of advising and mentoring. Another example of the kind of uh, structure and policy that, that I think is important um, is, is that a college or university should, should allow, uh, have, have in place ways for the faculty to engage in these kinds of activities. Let me give you a couple of examples. In, 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 uh, as, as part of this inclusive excellence uh, competition that I mentioned, uh, I go around and I talk to colleges and universities, I talk, talk to faculty, and I enjoy that for quite a bit. So I was at a, a, a liberal arts college in Ohio, and there were four or five schools that had all come to this meeting, and so I was talking with them, and I wanted to hear their ideas, and one of the ideas was, you know, David, we've got this great summer bridge program. Great summer bridge program. You know, we bring in 16 kids, and boy, by the time they're done with that summer bridge, they are ready for science. They do, they do well. All we need to do, David, is to double that. We need to go to 32 students. And what that means is that we need to get four or five more faculty to help teach this summer bridge thing. I said, that's great. What's it going to cost? I said, oh, you know, $30,000 or so. I said, that's fine. If that's all it takes, we'll give you the $30,000 right now. But then I asked, so where are you going to get those four or five new faculty members? Well, you know, there's lots of people here. They're all interested. I said, OK. Why aren't they doing it now? Well, it's hard because they don't have the time. It doesn't count towards promotion. Uh, there are structural things there. There are policy things there that the college could do that doesn't really cost $30,000. It's just a way of encouraging faculty to take, to take these things up. I'll give you another example. It was at a university, and they're saying, you know, what we're going to do with the inclusive excellence when you give us the grant is that we are going to create many more course-based research experiences because we know that that's really important. So that's great. And they said, you know, we're going to do one in ecology. We're going to do one in biochemistry. We're going to do one in neurobiology. We're going to do one. And you know, that's great. And they got the faculty who are all interested in doing this. So I asked them, so what does it take to run a research experience that is an authentic discovery for the students? So they're actually doing science for freshmen in a course with 20 kids doing it all at once. Do you know how to do that? It takes some skills. It takes some thought about what you're doing, what you're doing, when you're doing it, how you're going to manage all of that. That's another example where there was an opportunity for the institution to think about how they were actually going to be able to do this rather than just uh, run the course. So I want to close um, by um, reminding you about this, this book. I've been reading uh, Eric Weiner's uh, The Geography of Genius. Are you familiar with this? He was featured on NPR a while. So I listened to NPR. I said, oh, okay, i got to get this book. So I was reading this book. I am reading this book. And, it, and it's... So what Weiner is doing is he talks about how genius or creativity doesn't just occur randomly through history. It occurs in certain locations at certain times. So he talks about Athens and Hangzhou and Florence and Edinburgh and Calcutta and Vienna and Silicon Valley. And if, 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 you, read, if, if you read his various stories, it's a, it's a well-written, very entertaining book, um, you know, he, he pulls out different features, different characteristics of these places. And so what he concludes is that creativity is not something that's inherited or is genetic or, you know, you're just born with it. Rather, it has to be developed by the environment in which you find yourself. And he talks about the environment or the characteristics of a place or a locus that would, that would allow genius or creativity to thrive. And I would suggest that these are the same characteristics that a good research university should also be thinking about. So he calls it the three Ds. The first D is it has to be disordered. If you're too comfortable, it's not going to happen. There's a little chaos that, that's going on. It's disordered. Folks are beginning to think divergently. They're thinking outside the box, if you will, rather than convergently. So this first D is disordered. The second D is that it's diverse, because a diverse population or community is looking not so much inwards, but rather they're looking outwards. And this, in turn, is how you get innovation and creativity. And the third D is discernment. So the community has to be able to recognize a good idea 
amongst all the other stuff, which isn't such a good idea, and then somehow be able to nurture that. You have to be able to take some risks. I would suggest that there's a fourth D that Weiner doesn't include, but I'm going to include it, that would be good for a university to think about. And that fourth D is development. So I think it's important for us to think about how we can create an environment for the development of our students. It's not about selection, right? It's not about their ACT scores or their SAT scores. As was pointed out yesterday, that's easy. But that's not what a university should be doing. The question is, how can you develop the talent that you get in a way that they can be successful in many different ways. One of the things that Weiner talks about is that successful places that are developing talent, the mentors that are supporting the students or the, or the apprentices set aside their ego. So it's not about the mentor conveying to the student or to the apprentice everything she or he knows, but rather allowing the, the, the apprentice to, to really figure it out on her own. I will close there, and I just appreciate this opportunity, and I look forward to the rest of uh, today. So thank you. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, as you can see, I'm Michael Jackson. I'm from the University of Southern California, and I'm really pleased to be here. Thank you, Carol, for the invitation. Uh, what I want to do this morning is spend about 15 minutes talking about what I would consider to be a very remarkable turnaround of, a, of an institution, particularly with respect to undergraduate education. So to a certain extent, I'm going to sound like a cheerleader. It's going to sound a little bit like a commercial. Uh, but at the same time, uh, it's real serious business. And after I go through these slides, you'll, I think, understand why um, we were invited as the as a research university, a private research university that very much looks like a public research university. And we'll go to the first slide just to help you, for those of you who aren't very familiar with USC. It was established in 1880. Uh, it consists of a college of letters, arts, and sciences, and 13 professional schools. And uh, when I talk about professional schools, I'm talking about business, medicine, social work, dentistry, engineering, accounting, physical therapy, and on and on and on. Uh, and we heard from uh, Mark, uh, President Schischel Sh 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 last night, and a large academic medical center. Uh, USC's budget on an annual basis is about $4.7 billion, and our academic medical center's budget is about $1.4 billion. You can see the, the federal research dollars, member of the AAU, large faculty, uh, we're now recruiting. There was a comment last night, and I really loved this comment. And I couldn't tell if it was a it was a dig or it was just a comment. And that had to do with how private universities buy diversity. In fact, we bought a lot of diversity, uh, a lot of really strong students, a lot of students of color, students from uh, different parts of the country. Fourteen percent first generation students. And we spend about $243 million a year on financial aid, which, which may be the largest amount of financial aid, particularly for any private uh, institution. Now, here's, here's the story. 43,000 students. You can see how many freshmen transfer there are. But look at the 1995 six-year graduation rate. Six, almost 60 just about 63%. Look at the turnaround. And this turnaround, actually, we established this, this uh, mark of a 92% graduation rate by about 2010. And what I'm going to do is spend a little bit of time talking to you about how we got there. Uh, you can see how the SAT uh, rose rapidly. I know that we not, we don't all like U.S. News and World Report, but it was something that everybody was using and recognizing. We realized we were way down there. And now look at where we are. Uh, we're, we're now in the conversation with places like Berkeley and UCLA, Carnegie Mellon, and lots of the other top institutions uh, in the country. And you can see how the acceptance rate of students has, um, has diminished. Uh, over the years. Now, a lot of that has to do with, number one, getting more applications, 
obviously. When I arrived in 1995, we were getting about 12,000 applications. Now we're getting about 52,000 applications. Now the, the big bump, of course, was going to the Common App. Uh, and that we were getting about 40,000. Then we went to the Common App, then it got bumped up. It's the game that everybody plays, but actually it helped us get uh, access to even more students. Now, the focus. The reason why we were able to do the things that we did was when the university implemented its new strategic plan, undergraduate education was the number one priority for everybody. Stephen Sample, the president at that time, said to the community, the best institutions in the United States in many respects are more well known for their undergraduate programs and their graduate programs. We had pretty strong graduate programs, but we really need to improve, needed to improve undergraduate education. And we were all focused together. And I'll and you'll see a little bit more about that. And we also knew that we had to develop we had to develop our academic program, but we also had to develop all the stuff outside of the classroom because it was very uneven at the time. And when you're talking about, from my perspective, undergraduate education, and we heard about this last night from the folks from Seru. Am I saying that correctly? Yes. Uh, when we talk about engagement, you have to you have to look at the entire experience to figure out how to make sure the students have a great experience. So let's talk about some of the things that we did, and these aren't necessarily in order. One of the things that we, the first thing we did was we established a graduation and retention committee that could really look at everything that affected the undergraduate experience at USC. And those of us who were on that committee were empowered to take action. So for example, if you had the registrar there, the vice president for student affairs, the head of the bursar was there, you know, all the folks, if we came up with the problem that we needed to resolve, we could just do it on our own. And let me give you one kind of small example. We realized uh, that we were really driving students crazy because if you had a bill of less than $500 at the end of a semester, we wouldn't let you register for the next semester until you paid that bill off. And we, were, and we realized every semester we had about 600 students in that category. And they were kind of in this no man, no woman, no person's land, running around. And we said, this is crazy. We're bringing in 50 something thousand dollars a year and we're gonna hold this kid back because uh, some bill uh, has not been paid and in fact, if you let her register, she's going to get her financial aid and she's going to be able to pay that bill. We were, there were dumb, stupid things that we were doing ourselves um, that were driving kids crazy. General education was not only taught in the college at that time, but it was taught in all the professional schools. It was a money maker. And we realized that that wasn't going to work. One of the things we did was we brought in counselors from private high schools all around the country and we said, spend a couple of days on this campus, learn about what we're doing, and, and tell us what you think. And one of the things that came out loud and clear from them is, we have no idea what your undergraduate education program is. It's all over the map. And what would happen is, if you came to USC, and you majored in engineering, you started on a general education track then. And then if you decided to switch over business, there was a whole other general education program there. And we found at the end, at, at, by the time students got to the senior year, there were dozens and dozens and dozens of students who hadn't met the general education requirement for their major because they were confused. And we weren't doing a very good job of helping them understand what to do. So we changed all that. General education was only gonna be taught in the college. And we said to the schools, the way you're going to make income, because we're a, a revenue center management institution, I can go into all that, but basically what it very simply means, every dollar goes to the school and then the central administration taxes the school. So the more, uh, so the, the school, the goal of the school is to keep as much money as it can in that school so that it can carry out its programs. Uh, but so we encourage them to develop uh, minors. We also said that general education would only be taught by tenure track faculty. We strengthened the role of the vice provost for undergraduate uh, programs, but more importantly, we also strengthened the role of the provost. When I arrived at USC in 1995, the provost 
and the senior vice president for administration were basically on even par. So in some cases, the vice president for the senior VP for administration could overrule the provost by saying that costs too much. We shouldn't spend the money that way. And one of the things that Steve Sample did by bringing in somebody from me from Stanford and another person from Williams, another person from John, the, the provost from Johns Hopkins, is flip that to say that the chief academic officer of the institution and his or her staff should be the one setting the priorities. And with all due respect to the senior vice president for administration, he should be supporting that, obviously with, 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 with great input. But the chief academic affairs officer should be deciding what to do. We also, and this was, uh, this came up a little bit last night, we're trying to figure out how do we incentivize students to take advantage of the USC curriculum as now designed, where you have a stronger college and you have the professional schools also providing undergraduate education. So Steve Sample, again, this is one of these folks thought kind of hokey ideas but it actually took hold and made a difference. And that is, he said, what, what we want to encourage is for students to take uh, courses of study that are widely separated. So you could be in engineering, and you could be in art, you could be in English, you could be in biology. What, uh, get a, a course of study that would stretch them. So he came up with this program called the Renaissance Scholars Program and said, at the end of four years, we're going to give $10,000 prizes to the students who have demonstrated that they've really taken advantage of the breadth and depth of the USC curriculum. And that led to deciding to uh, establish prizes called Discovery Scholar Prizes for students who engaged in research. And then... Um, Global scholars, students who got in thing, who got involved in, in international activities. And clearly the stronger students were the ones who took advantage of this. A lot of us argued against this because we said, you know, the brighter kids are going to win these prizes. There's no question. And that's what happened. But what, what they also did was, as Steve Sample used to say, they served as bell cows for other students because they engaged in activities that others began to try. And we began to get hundreds and hundreds of students at least starting this process and then a good number of them completing it. We also developed early warning systems. One of the, one of the things we realized was when we were recruiting, we realized it was costing us $20,000 to recruit a student. <coughs> and imagine a system where you spend $20,000 recruiting a student and the first year 12% of them leave. And then the next year another 10% leave. We were hemorrhaging money. And we realized that we needed to really make sure that we were identifying the students who were struggling early and got them the help that they needed. And I won't read this entire slide to you, but you can see some of the things that we did. One of the real interesting ones that folks were surprised at was number two. The provost and the president said to the deans, that your merit increases and your performance bonuses are now going to be tied to retention and graduation rates, period. And we will keep track and we will help you as much as possible. That really got everybody's attention because one of the things, right? <laughs> because one of the things that was happening was if, you, if, you, if your initial major was engineering and you decided to go to business and we knew that almost Third, a third of the students who, just, who came in as engineers were going to go do something else. What, they would just wave them, bye-bye, good luck. So the student would go over to business and really be lost. So we said, there needs to be a real good handoff from one dean to another so that we really uh, make sure that the students do not get lost and they're uh, taken care of. The other thing that we decided to do was we had to diversify our undergraduate student body. When I left Stanford in 95 to go to USC, USC's undergraduate population uh, was uh, included about, it was 75% California, and 75% of those students came from Southern California. Think about that, very narrow. And when there was a recession in 1993, a big downturn in aerospace, there was a real dip in admissions. And the university had to lay off almost 600 folk. And so we quickly, quickly, over, over a number of years, we changed that. So now 
the undergraduate student body is about maybe 48% California, evenly split between Northern California and Southern California, and many more uh, students from across the country, and about 11% international. So we really diversified the student body uh, so that we would uh, have folks from, from different parts of the country. We, 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 we clearly raised our admission standards. We did use merit-based aid to attract the top students. Uh, you could get a trustee scholarship, a full scholarship, or a, a presidential scholarship, a half scholarship. So we were able to get really, really good students. The other thing that we did, uh, and it came on a little bit later, was we worked with the Mellon Foundation. I had a couple of grants there to support uh, minority students to get PhDs in in uh, sciences and engineering and the humanities, particularly in the humanities and social sciences. And they wanted to uh, see if they could help a place like USC establish a culture of mentor mentoring. And we got well over a million dollars over five years from the Mellon Foundation to, to change how faculty mentor faculty, how faculty mentor graduate students and undergraduate students. And we got the Academic Senate and it was signed off by the president, the provost, to include mentoring in the consideration for promotion and tenure moving forward to really uh, demonstrate how serious we were. The other thing that we had to do, if many of you know anything about where USC is, we had to become a residential campus. When I first arrived, by Thursday night, people were gone. There was nothing going on on campus at night. So, and our housing, the first year when I arrived, was only 85% full. So what do we do? We refurbished all of our undergraduate housing, to give some figures at about, uh, about almost $100 million. We built two new residential colleges from scratch for 900 students. We built a campus center, a health center, two recreation centers, undergraduate buildings in engineering, cinematic arts, school of business, uh, accounting, and the college. We probably spent a billion and a half dollars just to try to get in the conversation with respect to having uh, a, a, a campus where that students wanted to be on. We created all kinds of night activities, speakers programs, the other thing we did was we really tightened up what it meant to be a USC student. When I arrived in 95, you could go to USC for one semester and get a baccalaureate or a BS degree. That was changed. Now we're like most other places. You could only transfer in two years worth of credit. And, and as you saw earlier, we transfer students in just like uh, one of the UCs. So the only way this worked was we had strong leadership from the center, the president and the provost and the deans, but we had deep faculty engagement and involvement. And we were also, those of us in administration, were also held more accountable for our activities to make sure that we were all supporting the undergraduate experience. And we were consistently and clearly feeding back to the community what we were doing, why we were doing it, how we were doing it, and whether or not we were successful, and what challenges we still had to overcome. And we celebrated the achievements along the way, which was uh, really, really key. So what are some of the, the lessons that we learned? First, you've got to have a vision for what it is that you're trying to do. We realized that our undergraduate education experience for students at that time was mediocre at best, it was very uneven, and we decided we wanted to change that. So we, we developed very clear goals for uh, the various areas, and I've uh, gone over some of those. We did a lot of research and evaluation, so we knew, um, you all talked a little bit about this in your report last night, we actually analyzed all the courses students were taking, we analyzed all the gateway courses, we analyzed uh, how successful they were in the majors, uh, we looked at the GPAs and looked at how students who came in with, say, a 3.4 versus somebody who came in with the 4.0 did in majors. So we, we just did everything we possibly could to understand what was going on. The other thing we did was we used the WASC accreditation process 
uh, as a point of leverage, particularly with the internal community. So, you know, we really need to get this together so that we can demonstrate to WASC and our peers that we are worthy of reaffirmation of accreditation. And we created such a culture of help, and I, I love saying this because I, it, it was true, and that is you have to run from help. If you're flunking out, it's because you ran from everybody trying to help you. When you show up on campus, you have an orientation advisor, then you have a resident advisor, you've got a faculty leader uh, in, the resident, in the residential college, and you also have um, your advisors uh, in the schools. Uh, the other, I think, really important lesson is you can talk, 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 but then you finally have to make decisions and make investments. You have to experiment to a certain extent, but you have to make, I think, really um, uh, Im important investments and not, and not wait. If you, do, if you say, for example, we need to build new computer labs, you can't just keep talking about that. You need to go and build those computer labs. You can't just say, uh, we're going to have all of our general education courses taught by tenure track faculty uh, without doing that. And you may need more tenure track faculty. And so there was a big initiative, particularly in the college, to go out and hire more faculty. And you saw that on one of the slides. The other thing we realized, even though we would look at our peers and what they were doing, we had to keep thinking, well, how do we do this for USC? And we realized we couldn't copy Stanford or Harvard or Berkeley or any other schools. We could crib some ideas, incorporate some of those ideas. But we had to figure out how we were going to do this uh, in the USC way. We also know that these are long, hard processes. So what you see, I think, is we're just at the beginning of really understand the long-term impact of all the changes we made over this period of time. So we've been in this now for a couple of decades. It will really be interesting to see uh, what USC looks like from an undergraduate perspective an another 10, 15 years from now. Uh, and and uh, just to give you an example, uh, you saw in the write-up that we changed all of our undergraduate dormitories into residential colleges, hired faculty to serve as faculty masters and faculty leaders in those residential colleges. Uh, our, our, maybe our, our biggest project that is now, that will be completed uh, next year, is a new undergraduate village that will house 2,700 undergraduates at a cost of $700 million uh, that really, in, in, the, in, the, in a very structural and symbolic sense, it says undergraduates are, are really key and we're going to have the kind of facilities and programs and faculty, faculty leadership needed uh, to make sure they have great experiences. So I'll leave it there and uh, be back for some questions a little bit later. Thank you. I'm Doug Hesse. I'm at the University of Denver, uh, another uh, private school interloper uh, at this. The University of Denver is about 11,000 students, uh, 6,000 undergrads, 5,000 grads. We had two years ago our 150th anniversary. Um, about 45% of our students come from the state of Colorado. The rest come from widely elsewhere. So um, a lot of what I could say would not necessarily be translatable. And I, I take to heart um, your comments, Michael, about you can't copy things. You have to invent there. But what I'd like to do is to talk about um, what I think is, is, uh, is translatable to other situations um, using perhaps one of the hardest cases for scalability um, and we're getting really down to a particular feature at this level, and that is undergraduate writing. Um, for all sorts of reasons that I'll explain in a bit, um, you know, it's a very hard thing to scale using most of what we know about teaching writing, but I, I will say that this is not hopeless and that, that I do think there are some uh, excellent things that can be done. I should just note, further by way of introduction, I spent 20 years at Illinois State University, um, a comprehensive teaching intensive school. So I'm very familiar with a quite different side of the spectrum. And as uh, president currently of the National Council of Teachers of English, 
Um, I spent a lot of time on college and university campuses around the country, in, including uh, consulting and evaluating uh, uh, research universities. Uh, last thing I'll say by way of introduction, I, I re recall the first time I was here um, at Berkeley was several years ago. I was on a WASC accreditation team, and I could fi figure out what year that was because I remember I was... Um, we were out to dinner, and I slipped into the bar of the restaurant to see the progress of the Cubs game. They were in the playoffs. And I walked in just at the moment that Steve Bartman infamously interfered with the left fielder. Uh, and, and I walked back in, and I said, well, the, the Cubs have just lost their chance at the pennant. And, and I said, well, is the game over? I said, no, but just trust me. <laughs> And, and I was right. Um, so anyway, I've got, um, I'm going to indulge you with several photographs. This is really, I think, a pretext to show you where I go hiking a lot. And I'll resist the opportunity to annotate each of these. But I, I can't help but say that this is from the top of Independence Pass between Leadville and Aspen. You're at about 12,000 feet looking over at some 14,000 foot mountains there. You can just imagine where you're at in, in these other ones. And I do have um, some handouts, very old-fashionedly, that have all of these slides on it. So um, I don't think anything here is that profound, but it's available. So just a, a few words up front. Writing as a high-impact practice. Um, you can read lots from uh, AACNU, many publications, Nessie uh, has put out of you know, why writing matters as a high impact practice, and I won't make the full case here. What I will say is that um, writing necessarily focuses students' time and engage engagement. The words don't come from nowhere. They may seem to. There's proof if you've done it or not. Um, you have to figure things out for yourself and then figure out how to make them make sense for others. It's the case that writing is a mode of thinking. It's not just, oh, I think and then I write, but the very act of having to write is generative of thought and complexity and confrontations with what you don't know. Um, what you need to figure out, what is not compelling. Um, it produces an artifact and a trace, which is um, useful for readers. They learn things by it uh, in creating knowledge. It's also useful for professors. They can figure out what you know or don't know. Uh, and uh, you know, I can tell, tell you more about that. But anyway, I could make the elaborate case why writing as a high impact practice matters. There are several things that, that make this um, a difficult scalable practice, but I'll, um, I'll just elaborate a few of them. That writing, as I say in a homely fashion here, is not like getting vaccinated against chicken pox. That is, it's not a skill that you acquire once and for all. Um, and then you're good to go. And I think sometimes we look at writing as, well, they ought to come into the university able to do it, and any insufficiency that we're seeing is uh, a sign of remediation uh, needed. Those, those damn high schools didn't do their job, and so on. No, 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 no. You are continuing to develop those skills as you go, and especially as you encounter new situations. Um, I'll say a little bit more about the good and specific context and purposes um, in just a bit. But let me give you a couple of examples. Sometimes when you look at student writing and you say, dear Lord, this kid is really hopeless, um, it may be a sign that they're hopeless for the moment in the particular task that you've asked them to do, but may be able to do other tasks really well. So. Um, this was a student of mine uh, about three years ago. If you were given you know, these two chunks and, and uh, some absurd, on the basis of this or that, decide whether this is a competent writer. If you're given the one labeled number one in red, you're going, well, it's not profound, but yeah, probably confident. Extra. 
if you're given the one over here, you're going, oh boy, this, this person, is, he needs remediation, he needs, um, well, what's happened is the cognitive task of that second one is much harder. And it's beyond at least this person's ability at this point without some structuring. Um, and, you know, I could analyze this at great length, but, you know, th look at all the conventions the student doesn't have. How do you refer to sources that you're citing? Well, Garrison Keillor gets a first name and Coulter gets a whole name. Um, is it an essay? Is it a paper? You've got this syntax that's really jarred. Here's somebody who's really struggling with a task that is just beyond without some more um, structure from the teacher, his ability. So you know, don't always assume that if you're seeing writing that is substandard in your classes or across that it's, uh, we need to send them back for basic grammar instruction. No, this writer has basic grammar fine within a Vygotskyan sense of the zone of proximal development that he or she is at. Um, secondly, um, you know, well, what, what's good writing? And the, it depends. I would say that all of these are good writing. Um, that is, given the audiences and the purpose for each of these, um, these are all good writing. If you gave them each different audiences and purposes, you might say, no, this fails. Now that last one I threw in just to point out that, <laughs> I would say that this, if, if your audience and purpose is rallying your base, this is good writing. It certainly has proven effective for this speaker. <laughs> Now you bring in the, the ethics, the desiderata, the so on, then, then there's another matter. But all of this is to say that it would be a lot handier if there was one type of writing for all purposes, audiences, occasions, and that was the only thing we had to teach. Um, you know, we, we all know the difference between writing a journal article versus writing an op-ed versus writing um, a case for a provost for funding versus, you know, you name it. These require very different facilities. Um, a long way of saying that writers need to develop a repertory of strategies, processes, dispositions, and they need to be able to draw on them and analyze in a given situation, well, how do I proceed here? Um, which is to say, you learn to write by writing. Uh, and this is the, one of the sobering possibilities of uh, limits on scalability. Um, because it's not only learning to write by writing, but getting some feedback and some advice on that. Um, if it were the case that, you know, I, I've offered, off, authored three yeah. textbooks on, on writing, um, that Doug's golden advice for how to be a better writer was sufficient, well, I just, my advice was everybody have your students buy my books. <laughs> no, I uh, wish it were that simple. Um, teaching writing then has um, a number of aspects. It's no different than, than many other things, but as a skills-based um, enterprise as opposed to only a content-based enterprise, there are some challenges. You have to figure out well, what are the sequence of tasks that I'm going to have students do to build this capacity? Um, it's related, not entirely different than if I'm teaching somebody to play piano, which exercises, which etudes, how do you build up to better parts of the repertory? I mean, if it were the case that, you know, learning to play piano was like getting vaccinated against uh, smallpox, you could learn the C major scale, and then you could play the Chopin etude. No, not that way. Um, then in instruction, well, how do you help students solve two main problems? Generate ideas and put them in a form that makes sense to others. For a long time in writing pedagogy, we were 
too interested almost exclusively on the second part. Well, what does a good piece of writing look like? Here's the end result. Make it. Here's Michelangelo's David. Chop it out. Um, <laughs> And so the, 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 then the question was, well, what other things do writers do? How do they generate ideas? You know, how do they make those decisions? This takes feedback. Here's where the scalability problem starts really cropping in. Um, so Carol tries something, and I look at it, and I say, you know, this is pretty good, Carol, but right here, I'm not following this, or this reader wouldn't think that. Um, so that, um, I, I don't have a picture of Jim Harbaugh uh, as, as the university's, uh, as Michigan's president had yesterday, but, but writing is a lot of coaching, um, intervening. At some level, yeah, there's a basic curriculum set of assignments, but you, know, you may have particular needs, you may have other needs, and so how do I, how do I come in? Um, I won't then dwell with this too much, but obviously a, a, a major barrier of scaling writing, especially in a large research university, is, is the problem of numbers. Um, if, if coaching matters, if looking at where individual writers are and intervening matters, um, that takes some time to do. And at some point, um, it's not going to happen in the, you know, lectures of 1,000 people. Um, there are also some problems, I think, in design and alignment. We just heard Michael talk about the numerous general education programs extant um, at USC once upon a time. Well, students following various tracks through the university may gather some experiences here that are different from other experiences there. And so how do you align so that there's some way that um, you can be sort of confident, for example, that a junior major in my field has had certain kinds of writing opportunities and experiences before then. Um, I'll talk a little bit later about faculty development, but one of the challenges is every professor knows something about writing, and they've been reasonably successful at it. Um, but my common sense and your common sense and the actual research and best practices in the field may not align. So students come from various pathways. Um, you, know, you get into things like you know, how much do professors value the time on writing. Um, if you look at any writing deficiency as a sign of remediation needed, and a waste of my time doing my important thing, you're in pretty bad shape to, to be able to, to help those students. And then students believe a lot of things about writing that aren't useful, including that, oh, it's really easy for good writers, and for them, it's not. And when I tell students um, that an assignment that I've given them uh, would probably take me seven or eight hours to do it, you just hear these gasps, you know? <laughs> It's like, no, this is hard work. So you know, where does writing usually happen in the university? It can happen many places. Uh, obviously, in first year writing, it's very standard across the country. Um, not universal. And um, interesting question, should it be first year rather than some other time? We could talk about that. Um, the, I'll, I'll return to that. Um, can happen diffusely in writing across the curriculum, a now almost 30-year-old um, enterprise in American universities uh, predicated on the idea that writing needs to happen um, multiple places across the curriculum. And you know, most importantly, that writing can be, as an engagement strategy, privileged as a way of learning and teaching if students get better as writers, that's a side benefit. The primary benefit is you have to grapple with the material. So this has begotten a number of pedagogies, five-minute in-class writings, informal writings, you know, a whole could go into that. Other ways that this is getting performed now is with uh, certain writing 
uh, intensive courses that are required. Um, many schools have identified within each major a sequence of courses, um, maybe just one, maybe multiple, that are going to deliver writing within that major. So if I'm a biologist, how do biologists write to other biologists? Well, we're gonna teach that systematically in some writing intensive courses. Um, similarly, there are, there are a number of schools, quite a few actually, that have writing intensive uh, required general education classes. And I might, for both of these, point you to a place like um, the University of Missouri at Columbia, um, where, as, as an example of a place with writing intensive courses. I think writing, in, writing centers are extremely crucial in this. I'll return to this in a little bit. Um, but places where you know, the idea came up yesterday, I think, again, in uh, President Schlissel's argument about personalized learning where you can come for consulting. And then, you know, how do, how do you do this in the co-curriculum? The University of Denver, for example, um, one of the best investments I made in the program was to buy a big plotter to print posters. And if students then uh, come to a workshop on how to design and think about writing posters, we'll print their poster for free. Um, you know, it's a one-off kind of thing. It brings goodwill. It provides a service. They do some instruction. It's not for credit, but you know there are a lot of those things. And as I was even looking at the Berkeley Writing Center, I was looking at some one-off courses that that you all seem to offer here. Um, I think, in the interest of time, I might go really quickly, except to say here, the hugest problem with scalability of writing as required writing classes is, of course, faculty. Um, who teaches writing? And the way so many places have solved this around the country is, because this is time and labor intensive, we will hire people cheaply. We will use TAs. We will use adjunct faculty. We will pay them three to $4,000 a course. Um, they will teach at numbers of schools because they need to make a living. They'll be teaching seven or eight courses. Um, you just do the math about what time and energies are, are there. Um, um, I, I will say, I can talk about any of these, but in terms of writing centers, uh, I think these are so important because you have to think of these as, as centers for writing consultancy. The University of Denver's writing uh, center, um, which falls under my area, um, People who work there are consultants, they're not tutors. There are faculty who bring in grant proposals for consulting. There are certainly undergraduates struggling in their courses, but it's really identified as a place where if you have a writing um, task that you're facing and want some expert insights on in how to proceed, you, you can come and do this. Um, and then this also means that we do a couple of hundred workshops each year in courses across campus. So I'm the poli-sci professor. I've got this assignment that students are struggling with. Would the Writing Center come in and lead a peer review session on how to revise a draft in progress? So let me, let me proceed very quickly through a series of questions, you know, just extrapolating from this. This I can't help but note is atop Guanella Pass. You're, you're looking at on the right Mount Bierstaff in the middle, the aptly named Sawtooth, and on left Mount Evans um, across, and that lake down there is at 11,000 feet. Um, can technology save us? Well, we would hope. Not quite yet. Um, maybe. Um, here's the thing. It, in terms of providing instruction, technology can do what textbooks have done, provide advice. And it can do it interestingly better in ways that we haven't taken advantage of yet. So for example, we can have students who have completed a task well be interviewed. Here's how I did it. Here, here are my drafts, let me talk about those. You can make those available so that other students looking at a similar task can learn from peers. 
Um, just as an example, there are lots of ways we can enrich this. We can show multiple drafts. We can use um, you know, voiceover technologies to annotate, look what happens here. Um, so yeah, that, that's good. In terms of coaching and evaluation, um, we're not quite there yet. Um, there are a number of really brave and quite smart attempts to develop f automatic feedback systems. Um, here is one that is very locally produced. I don't know if any of you would recognize it. I don't want to disclose here. The problem right now with any of these um, artificial intelligence, you know, computer might be able to beat a Go master as it did a couple of days ago. But giving good feedback to students is still tough. What they can do right now, most of the technology is parse things and point out stylistic or grammatical problems. Um, so this is a chunk of writing that I threw up. Uh, you know, I need to be clearer and more concise, obviously, in this chunk of writing. But you know, my logic seemed to be fine, and yet you can see this howler of a sentence I threw in, a non sequitur about rutabagas in the Boer War, and can't find that out. So, so there are limitations there. Right now, what technologies are good at doing is well-defined problems um, you know, within certain parameters can give some feedback, but a lot of writing is messy. Can new faculty models save us? Well, sure. They cost some money, though, too. Um, that is, you can hire teaching intensive faculty, you know, pay them reasonable amounts of money. Um, this is the, one of the solutions that the University of Denver used. We have a whole series of uh, teaching professor lines, three-year you know, three appointments, five-year appointments, seven-year appointments, very rigorously reviewed for teaching. And I can tell you um, at some other point how to do this. In my writing program, we have those faculty on 033 loads. We're in a quarter system. They teach six courses a year. Um, and you start doing the math. Well, that takes a lot of people. I have 27 faculty. That's how we staff our writing classes with teaching assistant professors. The thing I want you to note here, though, is that in that zero quarter, they are doing professional development for faculty across campus. Um, we do a lot of work individually um, with faculty. We do a lot of workshops. There have been uh, about 290 of my colleagues at the University of Denver who have been through workshops that I've led with others. One thing in terms of uh, this is a curricular thing, um, I decided that if we were really interested in writing in the majors, we would initiate some projects where we tr tried to help faculty understand writing in their majors. So we turned it into research projects. We put out a call for proposals, grants. We would fund two faculty from the major. They would choose two students they wanted to work with. I would give them two writing faculty, and they would have one month to do a research project on what writing was looking like within that major, and then whatever conclusions they wanted to do. Uh, as an example, the political science faculty were grousing that the 30 to 40 page senior capstone project wasn't doing great. And they, decide, they discovered that no students were writing more than a 10 page paper at any time up until they got to the capstone. So of course they were struggling. So then they have a decision. Do we try to change teaching in the undergraduate, or do we try to change the capstone? Both of them were viable alternatives. Um, can pedagogy save us? A little bit. Um, that is, there's a lot of stuff we know about teaching writing that we could do more effectively and efficiently. And I take some consolation. Um, the Aram and Ruska, Ruxa book was mentioned yesterday. Um, you know, and one of its conclusions was, oh, you need to be doing these long papers and so on. Actually, this is a very robust study um, published in one of our leading journals that says, you know, actually, rather than long and more, maybe more quali quality and better is, is the way to go. Uh, I think faculty can learn these. Faculty development save us? I think so. Um, again, there's a lot we, need, we know about teaching writing, how we help other 
faculty across the campus learn it, it matters. Um, you know, in, in, in closing, I think that we need to think of, of writing as, you know, scalability as a way of modifying campus culture. And in some amalgam of all of these things, working on curriculum, working on faculty development, helping faculty understand and students understand the nature of writing and its development um, makes it an easier task. Um, there are lots of barriers here too, but I do think there are some things that, that, that we can do and not just throw up our hands and say, this is great for the University of Denver, um, the rest of us hopeless, we don't have the resources and so on. So I'll shut up now. So a, a primary goal of the symposium is to generate discussion and analysis around strategic questions. So this is the moment where if you've got a question that you think will lead that way toward discussion and analysis, it would be a great time to ask it and get our discussion going. Analysis we'll have to do later. We can do this. Ah, here's one. So, this one? Okay. Um, I'm curious from all three of you, you all touch on the necessity or the, or the outcomes of changing culture among the faculty and how in various ways you have, or I'm curious about how you've inculcated change. But I, I'm, I'm familiar with the USC story and um, cite it periodically as part of that change came from within the faculty who really wanted to change the institutional how you were perceived and, and what you were doing. But I'm curious in the other ways from, from David and, and Doug about, also about what you see as critical elements in changing faculty culture. Go ahead. I want to think about that. Okay. Um, again, this is a sort of throw money at it, but at least initially buying attention. When uh, the University of Denver implemented a uh, an advanced writing seminar. This is a senior capstone in general education. And it's focused around um, an issue or problem rather than out of a disciplinary uh, trajectory. So we, we, we paid faculty money to participate in extended workshops and how to do this. But then what I've typically done is to re really appeal to researcher sensibility among faculty. So when it came time to assess the capstone, rather than just imposing, I said, well, this is a really messy problem. So um, let me put out a call for participants in a, you know, to work as researchers. So I you know, we had a lot of, I chose 12 faculty from across campus. We spent a week looking at the writing that they had collected from their students, everybody's reading each other's. Well, this became a really interesting thing. Uh, they not only learned about what was going on in other classes, but um, learned about the problems of how do you assess writing at, at this level. So, you know, it, it, that, that writing in the majors, the WIMP project, appealed to the same kinds of things. So I think some of it is looking for ways to appeal to faculty interests. Um, another thing that I'll just note, uh, you've probably experienced this, anytime you have faculty from different disciplines who get together, they think, oh, there's this smart stuff going on on this side of campus that I don't know about. And historically, that's been one of the appeals of writing across the curriculum is it reminds people that they're at a university and not just in a massive department. You know, so, so one of the things that um, I saw work very well at Purdue when I was there on the faculty were um, two and a half day workshops being led by outside facilitators on getting faculty to come and talk about race. And you spend about the first two days of the two and a half days just learning how to listen. So talking about race is really hard for many of us in this country. 
And so it just takes time and it takes some real skilled facilitation just to talk about it. You're not going to solve any problems. You know, you're not going to solve the world's issues. By, but, but you do learn how to listen and how to begin to think not just with your head, but also with your heart. At the last part of this, the workshop then, uh, the facilitators would bring in some students who, uh, a handful of students who, who, who are alumni, uh, who would sit and they would tell us, and because we were ready to listen, they would tell us about what it felt like to be in our classrooms or in our laboratories. This is very powerful. This can be very motivating because it is emotional. This was started in the schools of engineering at Purdue, and then the provost then made it an expectation for all faculty at all of the schools, all of the schools, to engage in this. And so there are a couple of advantages that came out of this. So each workshop is about 40 people, and so you know you you get a big place like a Purdue or or a Berkeley. It's going to take a long time to go through, uh, right? You have to have many workshops. They did about three workshops uh, a, a semester. Um, the other, so so one advantage was. You, you hone your listening skills, and, 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 and I think that's really valuable because I think that's what leads to inclusion. The second is that we did it in parallel with another college. So I was in the College of Science. There was also a College of Agriculture. And so you get to know your colleagues who, uh, in, in, in a way, right, that, that you would never otherwise do it. Now, clearly, it takes time. It takes leadership. The leadership has to say, this is an expectation. We're going to make the time. You're, you, this is all you're going to do for the next two and a half days. When I moved to Harvey Mudd, we did the same thing. Harvey Mudd's a lot smaller, so in three workshops, we were able to cover the entire campus. But that was also very effective because it led to, I think, some, some real changes in the way Harvey Mudd does business. And now UCLA is, and North Carolina are now trying this, and we're, we're, we're providing some support for this. Same idea, you know, you, you bring your science faculty together, you have a facilitated workshop. UCLA has been doing this now twice. Carolina has now done this twice. And um, you know, you measure what effect it has, whether it's positive or negative, on, on the faculty. And, and, and I think, so, so anyway, if, if I understand your question, that, that's sort of what one, one approach that I, that I think can be very effective. So let, let me follow this up a little bit and not let USC off the, the hook here. Um, part of culture change is taking a long time. And one of the striking things about the USC experience is that you were able to keep it coherent over a decade to really, what are the lessons there? What are the things that should be studied there? Um, a, a couple of things. Uh, first, and it, it sounds, particularly for those of you who are from great schools like Berkeley and others, <clears throat> when I first arrived at USC, the faculty senate was really not taken very seriously. The president didn't go meet with the faculty senate, neither did the provost. So one of the things that Steve Sample and, and Lloyd Armstrong, the president and the provost, changed was engaging the, the faculty leaders very seriously within their um, governance body. So that was number one. Secondly, we made sure that the administration followed through on its promises with respect to improving facilities for faculty, uh, making sure that they were getting pay raises, uh, making sh and saying that we'll do all of these things outside of the classroom in terms of developing infrastructure if you will really take hold of this curriculum and make the changes that need to be made. The provost couldn't do it, the president couldn't do it, the deans couldn't do it, but the faculty and the department chairs could do it, and they could actually see the results, particularly from the perspective of, from the perspective of finances, because more of the money now stayed in the departments and in the schools. So they. Again, back to revenue-centered management, at a place like USC, the money starts in the school. And so the more money you can keep in your school, the more you can, you can use that money for faculty programs and initiatives. And so the faculty can see that as long as we do our job, we're going we're gonna to get more resources like everybody else. So. But you needed the, the, the sustained leadership of the chairs, folks in writing, folks in the sciences. And getting the whole thing working coherently. Yeah. I have a question. It was really interesting hearing about, oh, thank you. Um, let me start with kind of the, the Berkeley experience. And we know and acknowledge how much great work can be done and needs to be done to improve undergraduate education. Some of what you've been describing 
Um, and it was great to hear you talk, David, about kind of the, list, the importance of listening and how to change the faculty culture. But it's been fairly top down, the, the need for strong leadership, the need to engage faculty. From the student experience perspective, and I know that you, your groups had alumni in them, one of the things we're hearing at Berkeley, which I find very interesting and potentially inconsistent, I'm not sure, is um, some of the schools run their own student surveys, satisfaction surveys, and the students, for the most part, in big colleges, in engineering and chemistry, are very satisfied with, it, with, that, with their experience. So how do you reconcile that with what needs to be done to potentially improve their undergraduate experience? How do you bring that in and incorporate kind of the student, uh, what needs to, to change in the student culture in addition to um, shifting the faculty culture? So I, I, I would just re say in a different way what I, what I tried to say in, in my prepared remarks, which is that I think all too long we have, we in higher education have said, you know, the students are coming in and, and, and they have various deficiencies and so it's important for us to fix them. And I, I think that when an institution is serious about this, the institution should look to itself and say, how can the institution change? So Berkeley did a, you know, you were part of that Rankin uh, analysis in 2013 where all of the UCs did a, did a survey, basically, in terms of how people felt in terms of inclusion on this campus, as well as the other UC campuses. And while 75% of the folks, both the students and the faculty and the staff, said that they were pretty satisfied, that they felt that they were included, 25% said they weren't. And to me, that, and, and, at, and at Berkeley, that's a, that's a significant number of folks. And you can read the analysis, and it further tells us the obvious folks who are less feeling less included, include persons who work in the staff versus faculty, persons who are from underrepresented groups, first generation students, and so forth. So, so right, real, in, in some ways, no surprises there, but here's now um, some data which says that even though two thir three fourths of the people said, yeah, we're, we're pretty satisfied, a significant number of, of you said you weren't. And I think if a university is serious about what you're trying to do, I think it's important then to think about those quarter, those that one fourth, and to say, so what can we as a university do? Rather, it's not their problem, it's our problem. What can we do differently, changing our culture or, or changing our behaviors so that people actually feel more inclusive. Inclus inclusion is a personal feeling, right? It's not a, inclusion and diversity are very different things. Diversity, you can measure it by numbers. In you, you can have as many folks who are from different groups, underrepresented minorities, for example, as you want, and they, don't, they may not necessarily feel included. So inclusion is much more of an emotional thing, and um, so I'm not answering your question because I don't know how, but, but, but I, I would say that it's, it's important to recognize that we have a place, we have a distance to go, and regardless of what they might report in terms of their satisfaction, we have, a, we have some distance to go, and, and it is on us who, who work here. Students come and students go, but it is on us who work here to really change the, the culture. Very briefly, I think in our case, since we were engaged in, in full-scale institutional change, we would say to the students, you're, you're a part of this. You have to help us improve. So they realized that if they took advantage of all the programs, they would have hopefully a better experience. Uh, they realized that when they completed surveys as a part of our research efforts, and they said, for example, we need pick something, more dining options, or we need more recreation, recreation options, or we need better library hours, they, we actually, if we agreed with them, we would change those things. And they could see that we were actually doing some of the things that they thought needed to be done so they could have a much better experience. And I can give you many, many examples of that. So they were really tied to us trying to figure out how to get better and giving us feedback. I'll just really quickly say that I think making visible to other students the best work of their peers is a, is a great incentive for you know, what more they could aspire to. 
Um, so we do a lot of publishing in various forms of, of good undergraduate student writing, and it's edited by other students. And you know, I think all of a sudden realizing, oh, this other stuff is going on around me. Um, I don't think we try to so you know dismay or you know maybe it's not so great, but at least being able to raise the aspirations. So I think we have time for one more question, and it's just yeah. There we go. Thank you. Hi, I'm Jane Wellman um, with the College Access Foundation. I hope this is a question. It may be one of those comments disguised as a question, but I'm and I hope it's coherent. So let's see how this works. Um, the it's. I'm interested to hear about the analogies to rethinking and reforming and improving graduate education and whether any of your institutions or whether you're aware of experience, efforts to think systematically about reform, change, curriculum improvement. There seems to be an implicit, well, it seems implicit that there's a greater willingness to experiment and think about improvement at the undergraduate level than at the graduate level. And I think that our teaching models at the graduate education and student success statistics at the graduate level are at least as problematic as at the undergraduate level. And yet I don't see the same energy and willingness to concede that there's a, a, a need for a model of, of changes. I'm curious as to whether you're aware of efforts to think systematically about lessons from improvement of undergraduate edu education that generalize to doctoral education or vice versa. I can make a quick comment. That's a great question, Jane. I'll make a quick comment from the USC perspective. <coughs> I don't think that there's been the same level of attention in a broad sense on graduate education as there has been on undergraduate education. It's mainly, it's mainly at the school level. That said, I think through the program review process, the deans and the faculty I uh, have used those processes to focus on graduate education in their schools. Um, there's been a greater effort to create pots of money at the center that faculty could apply for to support various kinds of graduate programs. I think President Schlissel, man, say that 10 times right. in a row. Uh, we, do, we have employed some of the same kind of tactics that uh, they're using at Michigan to try to get uh, faculty and graduate students together uh, to, to work on common projects. But I guess at USC, and this may be too broad of a statement, it wasn't as broke as the undergraduate stuff was. It was really, um, talk about, uh, what's, what was that? Uh, it was a, the, you know, we were just, it was just a mess. And so that's where all the tension went. Didn't, didn't, didn't spend as much time on the graduate stuff. Now that said, there are lots of things still going on. Obviously USC is a, is a research institution, so there's lots of things. You know, I, I had an interesting conversation with Alan Leshner, who used to be CEO or uh, the, the head guy at, at AAAS, and, and he's, one of his, his Big things now is he wants to he wants to graduate education, especially in the sciences, to really be examined. And when you think about that, you know, graduate education has many different masters, if you will. And and so one of the challenges there is to figure out just why we have a graduate program. Is it to provide labor in our laboratories? Is it for the students' development? Is it something else? And so to me, that if if such a study happens and if if they really make any progress. It's going to get at the culture of how we think, how we work in a university. It's going to be, get back at, at faculty culture. So in many ways, I think that your question is an excellent one. And it's possible, possible, that the way we can see change on the entire university, including the undergraduate and the graduate levels, is to really focus on what's happening at the graduate level and to really start asking ourselves some hard questions about why we have students, what we expect of them, what they expect of us, how, you know, all of those things, what we're looking in terms of outcomes. And that may in turn, and I, and I don't know this, of course, but that may in turn then drive a broader cultural change at a university that would then reach the much larger, usually, number of undergraduates on, on a campus. So 
maybe that wasn't your intent, but I, but I think that's a, that's a really in interesting strategy. And, and that may get us off the dime here. But that may just get us off the point. Because right? everything that we've been saying is, is nothing new. Right? We, we've, we've been talking about this for a long time. <laughs> And very slow progress has been made, and 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 and, and so maybe there's a there's a different way of, of attacking it. So I, I think we have succeeded because clearly there is room here for further discussion and analysis, and and that was our goal. But let me thank our speakers again.